Welcome to the seventh lecture of EC113, Communication Electronics. In this lecture, we will be talking about filters. Let me just adjust the mic. So we're going to be talking about filters. There you go. Okay. Hello. Okay. So filters are a key component in our communication systems, mainly because they're widely used, especially for frequency selectivity. Remember the super heterodyne receiver? The key element for its selectivity is actually the filters. Specifically, this bandpass filter right here offers a uh, superior frequency selectivity compared to when we're going to use just a homodyne receiver. Okay. So filters actually clean up the signal from unwanted interference and uh, distortion. And according to function, there are four types of filters that provide frequency selectivity. And you have already encountered this, your low pass, high pass, band pass, and band stop. It's all right here. And this is the, this four will provide you with frequency selectivity and basically what you will use in your communication systems. Your all pass filter provides pulse shaping and equalization to remove any linear distortion. And this is what is widely studied in signal processing. All right. So according to implementation, we can also group the filters. But in this course, we will only tackle or discuss our analog RC filters. So uh, they're active filters. And the other one would be your passive LC filters, which will be deferred to the next meeting. Right. To characterize filters, we use the magnitude response. and uh, the magnitude response, I've shown you something similar in the previous meeting. Basically, we uh, use, uh, we have, not use, we have three different uh, parts of our response. The pass band, transition band, and the stop band or the rejection band. The pass band is where all the wanted frequency components are placed and anything beyond that or any anything outside of that will be rejected or attenuated. This is a typical filter response. So, uh, also a pass band. The pass band will also have some form of ripple. So the gain across this pass band is not that constant. Your uh, a three dB frequency is somewhere in your transition band, and anything beyond that, it point is where your uh, filter will stop uh, passing signals. We use the frequency response to characterize our filters and uh, we use the Laplace domain to study them. The Laplace frequency response is in terms of your complex value s which is equal to some sigma plus j omega. The magnitude uh, response is you just get the magnitude here and let s be equal to j omega. And the phase response is just get the phase of this when s is equal to j omega. So where do we start designing filters? You're a perfectionist. You design an ideal low-pass filter, but that's not possible. So as an RF engineer, you start with the most, the most basic one, our first order low-pass filter. Basically, as an RC circuit, that's an example, or an LC circuit, no, not LC, not RL circuit, rather. So something like this. And that is your basic passive filter. The basic low pass filter is an RC circuit. So it looks like this. And in terms of its Laplace domain impedance, the uh, capacitance has this impedance, the resistor is still the same, and the output voltage can be solved using voltage division. So it's a function of V in. So if we divide V out by V in, we get our transfer function, which is this equation right here. So with this, we can solve for the magnitude response. We have this equation, we have this response right here. So it's monotonically decreasing after some point which is the 3 dB uh, frequ 3 dB frequency. Okay? 
So just some notes. This is 20 dB per decade. That's the roll off of your first order response. The phase response is equal to this. Your uh, pass band compared to your stop band. And your pass band has a zero degree phase delay. Or your stop and your stop band it has a 90 degrees phase delay. So to analyze the uh, or to characterize the performance of filters, we use the pole zero plot. It's mainly used also for our uh, control systems. For filters, we are most concerned with the poles, not much on the zeros. Though the zeros do add some value, the response is mostly defined by the poles. Okay. A stable, uh, stable circuit will have most poles placed here. An unstable circuit will have poles placed here. Okay. Marginally stable circuits have poles placed here. Any poles placed on the imaginary axis have an oscillating uh, response. Any poles that are placed in the left-hand side has a decaying response. Any poles uh, that is placed on the right-hand side has an exponential response, exponentially increasing response, rather. Right. For our RC filter, recall that our RC filter has a response with like this. It's 1 plus 1, 1 over 1 plus S over omega C, which makes the pole equal to negative omega C. That means our circuit is stable and has a response that is monotonically decreasing over time. Okay. Our LC resonator, so by using voltage division, so with this equal to 1 over SC and your inductor with as SL, we have this response for its transfer function. And we can factor this and uh, we get two roots. I recall that the poles are when this denominator becomes zero and this is your pole. So the poles are at this. Uh, the poles are at these locations. They are on the imaginary axis. So the pole zero plot looks like this. Okay. And that means the response of this is marginally stable, always oscillating. For an RLC filter, you have this transfer function if you do voltage division. Again, this is 1 over SC, and this is SL. By doing voltage division, you get this response for your uh, RLC filter. And the poles are complex numbers. They are on the complex plane, and they are complex conjugate pairs. And uh, when you're, implement, Im you're implementing any real system, the poles will always uh, come in complex conjugates. Right, if they're complex numbers. So that's a typical uh, filter response, actually. Your poles are complex conjugates. Okay. And the quality factor can actually be defined by omega p. This omega p is basically the magnitude of the distance of your pole from the origin. So it's the length of this line right here. And sigma x is the real component of your uh, of your poles. Okay, for an RLC filter, the quality factor or Q factor is equal to okay, your omega naught is one over square root of LC. That's what I showed you in the previous meeting. Your alpha is this r over two L. Then we have a quality factor equal to this which is actually similar to uh, what I've shown you on the previous meeting. So generally, uh, if you have a pole location, negative alpha plus minus J beta, so always a complex conjugate pair, the quality factor is defined by omega naught, so the, this, the length of this line divided by the re two times the real component. Okay. So the question now is, we have a response that we like second order response, how do we implement it? 
we actually use a by quad filter. So a first order response, as I've shown earlier, has a very not very it it's actually not that steep of a, a roll off or slope. We want to use higher order filters to increase the the slope of our uh, roll off. And active by quad filters create a response that is quadratic. Right? Let's just simplify this. If we divide one over omega not squared on both sides, we'll, be, we'll end up with this response. And this response is possible using operational amplifiers. Uh, the, there are three types of by quad impl filter implementation. You can just use passive RC circuits, like something like uh, this. Oh wait, something, no, not, not like that. Something like this, so this is your resistor, and then capacitor, and then another resistor, and another capacitor, right here. Okay. Problem with the passive RC circuit is that we only have real poles. Maybe we can add some inductance, so we can have complex conjugate poles. And you now have your terminated LC. But what we are interested in is a better response with some gain. Your active by quad. And there are two types, your salient key and your totomas. Salient key, low pass, a filter, has a gain element. And two resistors and two capacitors. Okay. The uh, omega P... Right here, recall that omega p is its imaginary, no, its distance, wait, sorry, its distance from the origin, so that's omega p, it's equal to this uh, equation right here. Quality factor will just be omega p divided by this denominator. And as you can see, the quality factor can be manipulated using our gain G. Okay. So using an operational amplifier, we can implement your salient key uh, by quad filter. So we have this as your gain element. And this is a non-inverting amplifier. The, uh, the gain is equal to 1 plus your feedback resistor RB and your uh, series resistor input resistor R sub A. So this is the gain of this amplifier and that provides the gain element of your salient key low pass by quad filter. And this is just basically the analysis of that. The steps to an analyzing this is uh this is your uh node anal node volt sorry nodal analysis of the circuit basically and uh, again, the the impedance of this resist uh, capacitor rather is one over SC one. This capacitor has an impedance one over SC two. Using that, you do node voltage analysis. You'll arrive with your response. All right. Basically, the response of a salient key has a gain of K, which can be solved earlier right here, which is basically the gain of your uh, the gain of your amplifier right here. So we have this. And our uh, omega naught, which is, again, the distance of your poles from the origin. So distance of this to the origin is equal to this, 1 over RCRC. RC. And finally, the quality factor becomes this equation right here. Again, it's defined. it can be defined, rather, by the gain. So that's your salient key low pass by quad filter. You can uh, actually have its high pass and band pass versions by uh, replacing this capacitor with an inductor. You get a high pass version. So this becomes an inductor. You get a high pass version. Okay. A band pass version can be achieved by using a series LC circuit. 
Okay, series LC circuit. Alright. Another approach on a bi-quad filter is treating this as a system. Okay, let's just rearrange this. Your T of S is equal to V0 over VI. Okay. Cross multiply. And you end up with this equation right here. So we get one V0, this V0 times 1. We place it on one side. Alright. So we get this equation for V0. And V0 is a function of V0. We can implement this using a block diagram. So our um, input would be amplified by negative H, okay, which turns this to negative HVI, the output here. It will be added to two more values. One value would be negative S and V0 over Q, and the other would be negative V0. Okay. At this point, when you add them, again, uh, you're adding V0 here, as you can see here. You're adding V0 here, and at this point, you're actually add, adding V0 times SN. So this is SN. You're adding V0 times negative V0, rather, negative V0 times SN right here. And you divide it by Q, and you add it here. You get this equation right here. And after that, it will be... Uh, it will pass rather through these two blocks, which will create a response V0 equal to, well, basically, this equation right here. And it can be implemented using your, uh, uh, using this architecture created by Toe Thomas. Okay. So if this is the response for uh some S sub n, your S sub n here is normalized to a frequency of 1. Then, if we want to scale that up, we want this response. That means we create a, a circuit with these following properties. Your 1 over RC times RC becomes omega naught squared. The quality factor is defined by this, and the gain is defined by R2 and R3. So you just base it on these formulas. And that's for your second order filters. How about higher order filters like third order, fourth order, fifth order? How do we create them? Well, actually, uh, one way to build higher order filters is a combination of of your first order and second order filters, and then you just cascade them together. But the problem here is if you just cascade all these active elements together, it's highly sensitive for component mismatch. So that's what I was telling you since the start of this subject, that when you deal with systems, you assume that the match be between these uh, two systems are perfect. But in reality, you have to deal with them. And especially when you're using uh, biquad filters, the matching could be bad, right? So that's what you need to think about when you're designing filters. Anyway, let's study then the response of our filters. So let's recall again: uh, the uh, your biquad complex poles are actually on a circle of a radius omega p. And their angle from the real axis is equal to 1 over 2 times your quality factor. So we can actually express our poles in terms of the radius of the circle and the quality factor Q sub P. So our, bi our biquadratic transfer function would look like this equation right here. So the poles as a function of omega P and QP right here. And they will be real if the discriminant right here is positive. That is when QP is less than or equal to one half. A low pass response, we are guaranteed that if omega is zero, then 
the response of this one will be 1. So if omega is 0, s is 0, this will be 0, this will be 0, t of s will be equal to 1. If omega approaches infinity, then because of this s squared right here, that will approach infinity, the response will be 0. And at some frequency omega p, which is the radius of the circle right here, your uh, response will have the value of your quality factor. Okay. Let's normalize the frequency of this response to study it further. So this will, uh, at this frequency, at this response rather, your omega p, the radius of your circle, will be equal to 1. The magnitude response, just get the magnitude of what I've shown you. The phase response is basically negative, the tangent inverse of its uh, imaginary component divided by its real component. Okay. So the frequency response can be derived from the poles. Since we have already defined the poles earlier, P1 and P2, we can actually easily get the frequency response based on the pole zero plot. If you're at this point, uh, J omega 1, S minus P1 is basically the distance of this point from P1. And let's call that M1. So this is M1. And this S minus P2 is the distance of uh, this point from P2. This should be P2. And let's call that M2. Moreover, this S minus P1 has an angle phi1. Its angle with the real axis, okay? or its angle with the horizontal. This S minus P2 has an angle phi2. And that means to get the magnitude of our uh, response, we just get the 1 divided by the magnitude of this distance and this distance. Basically, you just get the magnitude of this length, rather, times this length. So, quite simply, this magnitude of T of S is equal to 1 over M1 times M2. And this phase response is basically just negative of phi1 plus phi2. Oops, sorry. Phi1 plus phi2. And this is actually the response. If you're at a very low frequency, the, uh, the, the distances right here okay, would be approximately 1. Okay? The distance right here would be approximately 1. And you'll get a response that looks like this. Almost 1. Okay? Somewhere maybe greater than 1. As you approach the radius of the circle, as you approach the radius of the circle, your response would actually blow up to some point Q, which is the quality factor of your filter. Okay, and after that, it will taper off, go downwards, once it's outside the circle. The phase response follows. At some point omega sub zero, which is your point here, okay, at this point, by doing some geometry, so somewhere here, your phi2 plus phi1 will actually be equal to 90 degrees. Okay? And if you go further, your phase will just decrease until it reaches negative 180 degrees at omega equals infinity. Okay? So this is some more breakdown of your frequency response. The peak of the frequency response is e actually equal to, or approximately equal to, rather, to Q. Okay, the actual Q is right here, somewhere smaller. And the slope of our response is negative 12 dB per octave, or negative 40 dB per decade. Now, depending on the quality factor, uh, the height of this bulge right here could increase. And this is actually what happens. So as you increase the quality factor, you, see you have some form of gain that happens in your circuit. And your uh, phase slope would actually increase 
as you increase the quality factor. Okay, so that's the behavior of our pi quad filters. Okay, now let's move on to how we classify filters according to their response characteristics. The summary of that is this. Butterworth, Chebyshev, Elliptic, and Bessel. Butterworth has a maximally flat passband magnitude response. Your Chebyshev has two types, type 1 and type 2. Your type 1 has a steeper transition band than the Butterworth, but it has passband ripples. Your type 2 2 has stop band ripples, but you have a flatter pass band gain. Your elliptic has equal stop band and pass band ripple. And your bezel is maximally linear in its pass band phase response. Okay, so these are basically your filter types. And the ones that we will design in this course is just the Butterworth and the Chebyshev type 1. Mainly because these two only have poles for the in their frequency response. So that's what we'll be discussing here. A maximally flat amplitude response in the passband is that your nth derivative of your Butterworth filter response at omega equals zero is equal to zero. Why? Because of that you have some moderate phase distortion. And the example here is a fifth-order Butterworth filter. Okay, let's look at the second-order Butterworth filter. Second-order Butterworth filter has a response with this function right here. And it turns out that the uh, angle of its pole is equal to pi over 4. So this is equal. This is response right here is actually the magnitude of t of j omega squared, can be broken down to t of j omega times the conjugate of t of j omega, and uh, to distribute that, the poles would have to be spaced apart over a circle of radius omega p. Right, the quality factor of your second order Butterworth filter is equal to square root of 2 over 2. The property of the Butterworth poles is that they are all, or they lie, all the poles all lie on a circle of uh, radius omega p. So that's a fundamental property of achieving a maximally flat bandpass response. So they're equally spaced with equal, uh, they're equally spaced in terms of angle and arc length, right? Okay? And each of them has a distance omega p from the origin, being part of a circle. So that's your Butterworth filter. A Chebyshev response is characterized by this k n of j omega right here, which is actually some epsilon cn of omega. The cn of omega is called the Chebyshev polynomial. So this is the Cheb polynomial. Okay. So Chebyshev polynomial, uh, because of this, this epsilon right here is the ripple factor. Uh, it defines how much ripple we allow in the passband. And the polynomial Cn of omega, the nth order Chebyshev polynomial, looks something like this. The actual definition of your Chebyshev polynomial is basically just cosine of nx. Okay? The, value, the value is between negative 1 to 1. Okay? If we get the cosine inverse, so if we get x equals the cosine inverse of omega, the Chebyshev uh, polynomial of order n can now be defined by substituting x right here. And your Chebyshev polynomial will look like this. And this is the response of the ripple. Oops. This is the response of the ripple in the passband. This is the response of the ripple in the stop band. 
Okay? So, some example Chebyshev polynomials uh, to the fourth order is this. So, it's 1 omega, 2 omega squared minus 1, and so on and so forth. A fundamental property of Chebyshev polynomials is this. So, this is the relationship between the different ordered Chebyshev polynomials. So, the Chebyshev response has a, a ripple in its passband and a very steep transition band. Okay. And this epsilon right here defines how much ripple is allowed in the passband. Okay. So Chebyshev type 1 filter looks like this, the response of a fifth order Chebyshev. So uh, it has a steeper transition band. That's why it's shorter compared to your uh, Butterworth filter. However, the phase response is not that linear. And as I've mentioned earlier in the course, a nonlinear phase response creates linear distortion. Okay, compare that to your uh, Butterworth right here. So in the passband, at the very least, it's kind of linear. Okay. And there you go. That's the difference between these two. The poles of your Chebyshev actually lie, instead of a circle, it lies on an ellipse. Okay. So it's um, located on an ellipse inside your unit circle. In this case, the normalized Chebyshev filter. And this is your fifth order. Okay. If we add some imaginary zeros, what happens to the response is it uh, at this point, in the frequency, you force your magnitude response to be zero, but because of that, you actually add a ripple in the stop band. This is the Chebyshev type 2 filter. Like, even though your response is a little flatter and you have a steeper transition band, okay, uh, you create some form of ripple in the stop band and therefore you let some frequencies here actually pass through. And this is an example of a Chebyshev type 2 filter. In exchange for a ripple, you make the transition steeper, you make the response here more uh, flatter. Okay? But again, because of this, you actually create a poor phase delay. And that just means that your poles lie on the unit circle, on the same circle, but you added zeros on your uh, PZ plot, pole zero plot. And that's how you actually compare, that's actually the, uh, the use of zeros in our filter design. The elliptic filter has ripples in both the pass band and the stop band, but the transition band is actually narrower to your uh, Butterworth and Chebyshev, and this is the fifth order elliptic filter, but your phase response is very poor, so it's not that linear. And uh, its pole zero plot looks like this. Your poles are on an ellipse, and you have zeros on the imaginary axis. You're basically... Uh, there's actually some form of trade-off between the steepness of your transition band and the ripple inside your stop band and pass band. Okay. Elliptic poles are actually the best filters to use if you just need to attenuate your uh, spurious signals or high-frequency signals. Okay. So, Bessel filters, finally... Uh, all poles are outside the unit circle, it's, uh, but it has a maximally flat group delay. What does that mean? It means that the phase response is maximally flat in the passband. And that's just it. So this is your Bessel filter, and all the poles are actually outside of your circle, of uh, some unit circle right here. And because of that, it has a lower quality factor. 
So just to summarize, this is your uh, pole zero plot comparison. The Butterworth is mainly on the circle, and Chebyshev type 2 also on the circle, all your poles. Uh, elliptic would be inside an ellipse. Also, your uh, Chebyshev type 2 also has an elliptic uh, response. Uh, sorry, it is on an ellipse, rather. And your uh, bezel has all poles outside. To compare the magnitude response, as you can see, bezel here has the poorest response, or the largest transition band, rather. Next is Butterworth. And then the others, your elliptic filter, as you can see, is has a steeper uh, transition band. But in terms of ripples, your elliptic has the largest amount of ripples in its pass band. <coughs> excuse me. The group delay of <coughs> excuse me of your uh, Chebyshev is a little. It's actually poor. Your uh, Bessel function. Our Bessel filter has a maximally flat group delay, as you can see here. And uh, basically, there's another trade-off, as you can see. Since the Bessel has the worst performance in terms of magnitude, it picks up for with its group delay performance. Basically, it does not uh, distort the circuit in its phase response. Or it does not distort the signal, rather, in its phase response. So that's the comparison of all your different filters according to their characteristics. In the next meeting, we'll be uh, designing them using active by quad filters and your first order low pass filter. Okay. Just the Butterworth and Chebyshev type 1 because they, <clears throat> they only have poles. That's the end of this slideshow. Okay. And um, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave a comment in the comment sections below. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next meeting.